Welcome to Dialogue Across Difference, an event series hosted by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Join us as Center Director Larry Jacobs and guests engage in conversations across the political and policy spectrum on issues of the day. Good afternoon. I'm Professor Larry Drake Jacobs. I direct the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Um, before we get going, I want to just give you a heads up. We value your questions. We love questions that challenge us uh, in particular. So I want to just give you um, an alert that at the bottom of the screen is Q&A button. Um, and that's how you get questions to us that we're going to be eagerly looking for. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for our program, Growing Black and Latino Power in Congress. Political representation of people of color and indigenous people is on the agenda in America. It's been an ongoing struggle and it continues today. Our topic is exactly that, the political representation of Blacks and Latinos in Washington, DC, the nation's capital. And we've got a terrific panel of folks who have been researching and thinking about this topic uh, for some time. Um, I'd like to first welcome Dr. Uh, Alvin Tillery, who is Associate Professor um, at Northwestern University. He is a notable scholar of American political development, racial and ethnic politics, and more. His book, Between Homeland and Motherland, Africa, U.S. Foreign Policy, and Black Leadership in America, uh, won the W.E.D. W -E -D, du Bois Distinguished Book Award from the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. Um, Dr. Michael Minta is an associate professor at the University of Minnesota and a leading expert in the study of political representation of African-American, Latino, and women interest in the United States. His book, his first book, Oversight, Representing Black and Latino Interest in Congress, is widely used. His new book, just published this year, uh, it's called no, Long, no Longer Outsiders, Black and Latino Interest Group Advocacy on Capitol Hill. Um, and I'm sure that's going to be um, an important topic today as we dig into this, um, this important issue. Moderator today is Jamil Scott, who's an assistant professor at Georgetown University. He's currently working on a book um, that, that examines Black women's political emergence in state level politics. I turn things over to Dr. Scott. Hello, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us today. I am very excited for this conversation. I think it'll be a great one. Um, and, you know, I think that we are at a really great uh, point to talk about what's happening in Congress, right? Um, we're at a time where a quarter of voting members. Um, or almost a quarter, about 23% of the U.S. House of Representatives and Senate um, identify as racial and ethnic minorities, making the 117th Congress the most racially and ethnically diverse in history. And so there's a, a long-running trend of higher numbers of non-white lawmakers on Capitol Hill. Um, this is the sixth Congress to break the record set by the one before it. And um, I think this brings us to a really important uh, point or rather um, uh, uh, where we're thinking about um, the power of um, minority representatives in Congress. In the late 60s, uh, Bayard Rustin was considering if protest or holding political office was a way forward in gaining rights for African Americans rather than continued protest. And so, uh, but uh, we see in the 70s, elected black leaders from the 1970s and onward marking a transition from that period of prolonged protest to participation. Um, we see the founding of the Congressional Black Caucus in the early period, in this early period, as well as uh, later on the founding of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And so with this increased representation in Congress, um, it's brought a really great scholarly conversation about the impact of descriptive representation. 
And with many discussions about the impact of um, the type of the uh, issues that minority represent rent minority representatives rather bring to the table in their advocacy of minority interests. And so as we look at what's happening today, I think we're back at a point where we're thinking about Bayard Rustin's question again, right? The impact of protest um, and the impact of representation of Congress, um, impact of uh, minority representation in Congress. Or um, I, I think that we can think about this also being a point where we're seeing the, the proliferation of both and so this brings us to a great point of conversation about uh, Michael Minta's book, where he's exploring um, this idea of um, interest groups um, and their advocacy, uh, particularly for minority interests, as well as how representation of minority office holders, um, office holders on uh, the Hill is meaningful as well. And so um, I want to start off the conversation with talking about um, what the role of representation looks like today and, and um, how does Black Lives Matter um, and other um, advocacy organizations shape the agenda? So do you want any one of us to jump in? Oh, or? jump in, sorry, <laughs> jump in. So I, th I think that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go next, Michael, and then we'll turn it over to you for a bit. I, I just want to say thank you for that great framing, uh, Jamil. Michael, thank you for uh, a, a wonderful book. I think that, uh, you know, Jamil's really teed up. Uh, the key issue, like, as you know, when we started out studying, uh, you know, minority representation in Congress a couple decades ago, you know, we were schooled up on the old, the old debates about institutionalization, you know, you know, Marguerite Ross Barnett and Haynes and all those folks tell, you know, asking the question, like, do you have to, you know, become a more institutional force in Congress in order to really have, you know, real representation of, of Black group interests, right? And so, you know, your book, I, I think, really provides a, a really strong and clear answer to this, right? It's, it says, yes, it does matter that, that, you know, kind of, holding power, becoming part of the, the so-called, you know, as Mo Fiorina would say, the, the Washington establishment, right? That, that has some real positive externalities for, uh, you know, Black people, Latinx people, but also, you know, everyone else who is kind of working class and marginalized. And, and a big part of that is because of the, the, the diversity of the institution now. And so, you know, for me, Jamil's question about, well, what about Black Lives Matter? What about the age of this kind of new protest? I think that this really points us in the direction of asking, you know, are the leaders that are there in the interest group world and in the Congress themselves, are they now so much a part of the establishment that they are kind of constrained by that? reality, right? I think the Black Lives Matter example that Jamil raises is is uh, is really, you know, potent, right? And a lot of my own work shows that, you know, Black members of Congress were really slow to adopt the hashtag Black Lives Matter and their Twitter, in, in sort of their, their social media messaging, you know, uh, I was really disappointed to see several Black members of Congress kind of distance themselves from the movement, even after you know, there were papers, including some of my own, that, that showed that the Georgia Senate seats flipped in part because of Black Lives Matter messaging, right? There's still this kind of, oh, we can't say defund the police, right? And so, you know, this is really the kind of core question that I wanted to raise, like, you know, is there a limit, an upper limit to where this institutionalized power can go uh, because they are part of the establishment now. And so, you know, I would love you to kind of jump in and, 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 and address that and, and, and see if uh, it makes any sense. Well, uh, first of all, I want to um, thank uh, Professor Tillery, Professor Scott for, for um, coming and, and joining in this uh, discussion and to talk about these important issues and also to um, mentioning my book and reading it. So I appreciate that anytime you, you do that. But, um, uh, and I, and we wish 
you guys are in Minnesota, but obviously COVID has changed everything. So we're continuing with the, the Zoom process here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, these questions are obviously part of the motivation behind the book. And like, especially with Black Lives Matter, you know, I, I, I seem to live in places where they have big protests. I lived in, St. <laughs> in the St. Louis area, Ferguson, and I moved to Minnesota and I'm like, you know, we're finding pandemic and then George Floyd, I'm like, what the heck? And then, you know, obviously family members, friends, like, are you okay? Are you okay? And then I'm just like, man, I know how to pick cities, don't I? So, uh, but yeah, it, but I started thinking about this question. I was like, okay, Black Lives Matter, and you see people critical of the NAACP. Um, and then when you have the immigration protest, people are like, okay, where are these traditionals? Where's uh, the National Council of La Raza or, or these Latino groups? Why aren't they really speaking for us? And then, you know, the common criticism is that they're not really representing the interests of Blacks or Latinos. They're, they did it years ago, you know, decades ago. Um, they were really strong and forceful, but now they're out of step. You know, you need these new grassroots organizations, younger people use, utilizing, like you said, Twitter, um, Instagram, Snapchat, I guess, uh, to get that message out. And you got these old folks. And now you made me feel old when you said we start looking at this two decades. Ago. <laughs> uh, hey, man, that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, man. No, Jamil, she's not like that. He's she's not, not with us. <laughs> we, we, you know, you start looking at these questions and you're like, man, are we true? Are these organizations truly out of touch with what people want and the civil rights needs of the day and um, the interest? And so I'm like, well, only one way to do it is just do some research on it and see if it's true, right? And so that's kind of like what started motivating this book. And like, okay, we know issues like police brutality, um, um, unequal treatment by the criminal justice system. I mean, the NAACP was founded on this premise, right? Uh, the lynching of Blacks. And so now is this organization so removed from today's struggle? I mean, Yes, I mean, we, we, we like to see what's happening today, but this has been happening for centuries. And so the book really kind of goes in and looks at, okay, what is the NAACP doing? What's their strategy? We know this organization is constrained by the resources that it has. It doesn't have the same type of resources that the big business in terms of lobbying teams and people on K Street. So how can they, so the first question is, do they represent those issues. And so I went through, I looked at their, their, their legislative priorities, their resolutions, and many of the same issues that Black Lives Matter talks about. The NAACP is covering those, those issues. It's on their agenda. They're lobbying in Congress for these issues. We just don't see it. Who wants to go to C-SPAN and watch a congressional hearing where the NAACP is testifying? or where the National Council of Ross is testifying. And so, so they're doing things, they're just not, they're just not, mar you don't see the marching, we don't see the protest. Not saying that, that that doesn't happen, but most of this stuff is kind of an insider game where they are advocating for many of these issues. I mean, John Conyers introduced the uh, in racial profiling bill almost when he was in Congress, almost every session. So, I mean, these issues are, are not new. Um, the NAACP works with these congressional members to get these issues on the agenda. Now, how effective they are, now that's the question, right? How effective are they in terms of getting this legislation passed? That's what we're, we're, we're kind of concerned about. I'm can, talking way too much. So. I, I, I think, can I, I, I think the, the great subtlety of your book, right, is that you point out that you know they 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 get attention from members of Congress even when the Democrats don't control it, right? That's great. Yes, they're testifying. That's great. Uh, the, they they're taking advantage of the new diversity and they're getting outputs, a bunch of different types of outputs, markups, right? Sort of. But 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 the real question, I think you raised it yourself in one of the chapters. I think it was a chapter on lobbying can they really compete with the moneyed interests, right? Uh, the corporate interests, 
the big donor class because you know despite a you know, no matter how successful they are they're still spending a lot of their time lobbying for you know direct support for themselves and for their constituencies so they're not shaping the debate over things like you know larry raised in the beginning and jamil too the time now is about voting rights so can an NAACP or uh, Unidos or La Raza, can they protect their people through the means that they're using when the Coke network has, I don't know how many billions of dollars that they can sprinkle on a guy like Joe Manchin, right? J Joe Manchin met with uh, <laughs> NAACP and everybody, but ultimately is the problem for our groups, the groups that represent people of color that they're not moneyed up. And in an age post Citizens United, that matters more than maybe it did 15 years ago. I don't know. No, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, and the fact that these organizations in a lot of ways have to form kind of like these nonprofit entities, like a, a charitable, a 501c3, a charitable organization that we, that we all kind of give to so they can get donors. I mean, NAACP, um, Unidos USA used to be called the National Council of Ross. I mean, these groups, uh, you know, they have they have to get money and and the memberships, many of the, so the NAACP is a membership organization, Unidos USA, not so, um, but their members don't have the most money and the resources. Uh, like I said, they don't have the Koch brothers, anything like that. Um, and these groups also, um, when you look at how you look at their budgets, they rely a lot on kind of like these these donors, these private foundations, these these um, corporate places. And so the question is, can they compete with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce when they're talking about trying to get um, fair employment practices, get minimum wage? Can they compete? Um, well, in a money for money, dollar for dollar type of fight, no. But what the you know part of what I noticed is over over the years in the research is that what they do is they're very very um, creative and and you got to be creative right in order to fight these battles um, is that to try to intervene kind of in the redistricting process where you and right now redistricting is big you know we just had our census and states right now here in Minnesota everywhere they're drawing the congressional districts and the state legislative districts. And so the end, groups like the NAACP, um, uh, MALDEF, uh, these groups have been involved in helping or working to help shape and create more majority black and more majority Latino districts. So they're like, look, we're not gonna have the type of money where we can compete dollar for dollar for these groups, but if we can get involved in the process to try to increase the number of legislators that are supportive or sympathetic. And also not even just that, what I see in my book is advocates, you know, not just someone who, oh, you, could you introduce a bill on racial profiling and could you spend time trying to push it through Congress? No, like people who are thinking already, like what can we do to solve some of the problems that exist in these very, in our communities? And so, these groups play big roles in the lawsuits in order to create these majority black, majority Latino districts. And that has resulted in an increase in the number of blacks and Latinos in the House of Representatives, um, even in, and in state legislatures. And so these groups have these advocates. And even, you know, Al, you know this, Jamel, you know this, like when the Congressional Black Caucus started growing in the 1970s, I mean, small compared to what it is today, I mean, Black legislators had this, they, they had to take a study because they're an some of them viewed themselves as an extension of the civil rights movement. Should they be legislators or should they be civil rights activists? And so they, they concluded like, well, the bet our job is to be a legislator. And so that might involve some compromising. That may not be doing the same things that activists do. And so that's kind of like, that's the challenge, and I think we were talking about this before, that's the challenge that you're gonna have with saying, okay, creating districts so you can get more Blacks and more Latinos in Congress doesn't necessarily lead to 
greater representation? Are they going to represent the same way that activist groups are going to do? And, and that is the, the ongoing challenge. I find some support for that um, in, in terms of bill introductions. The groups are able to testify more. But again, we want to know, does it lead to the type of radical change that, that you would expect from a, a, a civil rights group? Um, I'm wondering what you, your thoughts are on um, the idea of visibility, right? So um, NAACP and, and other groups, right, they have a strong presence in terms of um, doing these uh, an outsized presence in some of the things that we think about as non-visible work, right? The lobbying, the uh, lawsuits, et cetera, right? But um, it seems like there's something to visibility for the public, right? So um, do we think that uh, you know some of these groups that we see on the horizon now, are they gonna be the ones who are doing this invisible labor or do we see a world where uh, visibility is what the public cares most about or even what gets legislators attention? No, that I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I think that when you look at the leadership and the board of these groups like the NAACP, you know, those, they say, I mean, there's still, I mean, I know they're trying to get younger. Um, the NAACP with Ben Jealous back, you know, years ago, they were trying to get younger people. They were trying to use social media more, trying to use online presence, really trying to get more youth into the organization and just being more nimble in that way. Um, because it is important, right? Like how many people like us are gonna go and read congressional transcripts of hearings or, or watch C-SPAN, right? Like, and then also, and, and also the one thing that I noticed too, the advocates for these groups aren't gonna nest, and, and that's the tricky thing about lobbying. Now, many of the advocates in these groups, whether it's UNIDOS, Leadership Conference of Civil Rights, NAACP, they don't, in a lot of ways, they don't wanna draw attention to what they're doing, like their work on the Hill, right? Because they don't want it to be perceived as lobbying. They call it advocacy. And so if you start talking about lobbying, then that's that's a bad word. And then in a lot of these groups of charitable organizations and their restrictions on how much they can lobby. So they don't, so in a lot of ways, they like being invisible to a certain extent. But you're right. But part of this is people need to know, like, what are you doing? And I can, you and I, we can go and we can do the research and we can say, okay, yeah, they're testifying at this hearing. They're meeting with these legislators. Um, they're, they're, they're engaging in markup hearings where they're actually amending the bills and getting important provisions in there. Um, but it's kind of like, that's the type of stuff uh, that these groups, which, which is really kind of like the question, that is the challenge, right? How do you kind of promote the things or let people know what you're doing without drawing attention to this idea that you're lobbying and you're doing too much in this arena and there are clear restrictions on how much these groups can engage in that that type of activity that's that that's 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 the big challenge that i noticed by talking to uh the the advocates at these groups and also just reading um the congressional hearings But they're, but they're doing stuff. That's why I guess this is what we're having it. They're doing stuff. They're, they're doing things that it may not just, they just don't want to publicize it. I mean, I can't, I mean, Hillary Shelton, who's like the head lobbyist for the NAACP, I think he still is. I mean, yeah. I don't see him doing many press conferences talking about what he's doing. Can, can I ask you, Michael, you, re you referenced the, 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 the rebrand, La Raza's uh, rebrand to Unidos. Yes. Does the NAACP, do the NAACP, NAACP and Urban League need rebrands? Would that help them with the younger generation? Because, you know, when we look at the membership, you know, there's a, 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 a generational cliff for the NAACP, right? And so, um, and I've had young activists in my Black Lives Matter work, you know, I say to them, you know, you guys are kind of reinventing the wheel. Like, why haven't you brought this energy into the NAACP and they'll say, oh, you know, well, professor, the, it's, it's the name or, you know, it's just filled with a bunch of older folks who don't want to listen to us, right? And so talk about that a little bit, you know, would they be more effective 
and they don't necessarily need to change the name, but just kind of brand a little bit differently to capture some of that Black Lives Matter energy that I think Jamil was really referencing in the beginning of our conversation, right? No, I mean, that is a good, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, Unidos, they, well, the National Council of Rights, they changed their name because it was like of the race that was in there. And apparently it got into, you know, um, Janet Mergia, the, the president, she was like, it kind of got in the way of some of the efforts they wanted to do. They thought it was divisive and polarizing. So that's why they changed the name. What's so interesting, sorry to interrupt, like that's why they chose La Raza in the first place is they were a kind of race consciousness movement in opposition to LULAC, right? And so yeah. that, that's the proof of concept of your book is that she's like, okay, we've got to change that now because we're the establishment, right, on some level. No, I mean, it, it is. I mean, La Raza, I mean, I was like, well, I, I actually, anyway, I, um, but I understand, like you said, the branding and also in terms of getting the message and also fundraising. So these groups rely a lot on fundraising, uh, just like a lot of nonprofits. So it's nothing new to just those groups, but um, clearly a lot of donors and other people went back saying that this name was divisive. But you're right, that was the reason why they chose the name. Uh, and you know, with the NAACP, part of that was, um, I mean, there have been debates about color. What you know, we're not colored anymore that we need to change the name. And, and the NAACP for the most part looks at issues that pertain mostly to black folks. So why don't you change it to something with blacks? And I, and I think they, they had that conversation. And I mean, many of the issues that NAACP, yes, blacks, but I mean, people of color, uh, many of these issues, voting rights, racial profiling, these aren't issues that just impact Blacks, and we it, we know that. Um, so, so I think that's one of the reasons why they decided to stay with the name, and also just people know the NAACP, even if they don't know what the acronym stands for, um, they know it. They've heard of it before. But I, I think you're right. That's that. I don't know if there have been any recent debates about whether they should rebrand it or or maybe even have something like. Uh, a youth count. I mean, they, you know, they have these youth councils. And remember, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, kind of came out of the NAACP youth councils. And so I don't, I mean, I don't know if they're thinking about maybe trying to spin off and have some like youth type organizations that you don't necessarily have to call it NAACP, but it would be affiliated with NAACP. And then, like you said, you could get past like, uh, the old folks set in their way, like this is how we used to do it, and you know, march like king, and all like, like you know, those things are outdated. Maybe have a, a, a new organization uh, uh, like that. So I, maybe those conversations are happening. Um, but yeah, it, I, I, th I think it should be something that that might be considered um, if if they get more younger people in there. I think if you have kind of the old guard, I don't they, they don't see a reason to change. Right. Yeah. Well, and then I'm, I'm wondering here if how structure matters, right? Because Black Lives Matter has largely um, branded itself as a, a leader, leaderful movement, right? That there is no hierarchical structure like we would see in an organization like NAACP. And so what would that mean for younger people coming in and what they might have been used to, right? Where um, in you can affiliate yourself or or um, think about yourself as starting a protest right where in, in in ways that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do in an organization that has a set structure and way of doing things right there's a a protocol for things mm -hmm. right um in ways that um i don't think blm is necessarily um set up for itself no i think that's right that's why they <clears throat> patrice colors got into so much trouble i mean we still don't know where the 90 million went, right? I mean, and so, I mean, I think that that's a great extension of my question, Jamil. It's like, think about what the NAACP could do with 90 million in one year, right? But like their kind of refusal to brand or bend to the younger generation. I mean, and, and then the other side, we've got this group that just is raising a ton of cash you know, and I'm not saying this, you know, my respondents to my surveys say that they're not sure where all that money's going, what the advocacy is leading to. I mean, I can, 
go to South Evanston or South or West Chicago and encounter black women who've lost children to gun violence. And they're like, don't talk to me about Black Lives Matter. Don't want to hear about it. They've been nowhere in terms of, and so but you say NAACP or their local church or, you know, violence disruptors. And they're like, yeah, those are the people who've been, you know, so it's, it seems like there's great potential if they could figure out what Michael's suggesting they need to do for getting some more of that cash to make a difference at the congressional level. I, I don't know. So it, it looks like we have uh, a good set of questions um, uh, here. So I want to start um, bringing those to the table. And our first one is, uh, do you believe that the Black community needs to build their own political union of votes to address the needs and concerns of their community? Um, let me see. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, their own political union. Yeah, I mean... That's 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 the problem, right? Of organization that we, that, you know, political scientists, everyone, people, in or trying to get people to form an association, right? Like someone has to do it. Someone has to have the resources. Um, and I mean, many other groups would say, well, why would you need to reinvent the wheel, right? Because we have existing organizations that are concerned about many of the same issues that you're concerned about. Um, so I, I think that the Black community, in a lot of ways, they, uh, I mean, they, again, it, it just depends on what interests you're talking about. Can you get an organization? Can you get money? You're going to need resources. You're going to have to staff it. So they would have some of the same, same problems. I think the spirit of this question is like this whole idea of independence, right? Like you don't, you don't need to have kind of like these donors. You don't have to have uh, these outside that you basically just have the money and the resources of black individuals it, living in a community funding their resource and I think some are doing that but to do it on the type of scale that requires you're talking about policy change getting laws enacted you're going to need more resources you're going to need staff you got to have people in DC you got to have them in the state uh, and I think that would be the challenge of just trying to have kind of a complete grassroots organization trying to do this effort. Um, so I hope I answered that question. At least that's my take on it. I don't know if Al wanted to say anything. About no, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, I, I, I've been thinking more and more, you know, and, and again, to go back to Larry and Jamil's intros, right? Like this thing with voting rights uh, and this thing with the, the 3.5 trillion uh, for the reconciliation bill. I mean, it, it just, it's, it's just, another demonstration of you know the fact that black votes brown votes are not being figured in the larger calculus right once the elections are over and so where's the gap the gap is that these black brown communities i think that they do need like a coke network right if we could get robert smith and tyler perry and you know all these folks to put a couple billion dollars on the table to be a kind of rival to what the Coke network and all those folks have, I do think it would go, you know, further, right? I also think that what we're seeing with, with Congresswoman Jayapal and the Progressive Caucus, we're beginning to see the inklings of a kind of splinter Democratic Party forming up. I think that that would be, that would enhance the power of people of color. Because then nobody could get a majority in the, in the House or get anything done if they do what they're trying to do with the reconciliation bill. And they'd have to get best offers to advance their, you know, their centrist bills. And so, but the fact that a guy like Joe Manchin or someone like Kristen Cinema can just say no because they're beholden to donors just goes to show you that we're not playing in that market, right? Um, in ways that matter in these contexts. And, and I wanted to add one thing. Um, and this is, I, I wish I had the slide, but you can go to the Center for Responsive Politics. Um, I use their stats a lot and they just collect it from the Federal Election Commission. It's something like, depending on how you slice it, 0.3% of the US population 
has donated $200 or more to federal elections. Now, just let that sink in. Two tenths of a percent donate to political campaigns. So now within that two tenths, or, or let, let's, let's just be generous and say that my memory, it's, it's actually 1% of the US population that's 18 years or older gave to a federal campaign, $200 or more. You know, despite all these things about small donors, it's still, you know, it's these big donors. So now within that group, what proportion of that 1% has give that are black, Latino women that are in these donor class? And then in this donor class, are they representative of the general population? So that so those are the things, right? So politicians in a lot of ways, and we look at these elections, they're expensive. I mean, I think the average to run in the US Senate, some like $8 million, a house seat is like a couple hundred thousand dollars. And, and I don't think CBS or NBC or these people are giving discounts to advertise on their on their airwaves. So um, so that's why money still is still a big factor. And that's why members spend so much of their time raising money because they have to pay the bills. They got to hire the staff. They got to do all this. And so the que and, and so the question is about the representativeness of this donor class. So, yeah, big challenge. So earlier, um, we started a conversation about activists versus legislators. And um, the question from the audience is this. Um, we have two people from Georgia, Stacey Abrams, an activist, and Raphael Warnock. Who can have the biggest impact for Black voting rights and equality? Do they work in tandem? So I went to school with Stacey and Raphael. <laughs> I knew them both pretty well. So I'm going to say yes to that. <laughs> they absolutely do. Uh, and uh, uh, sort of more than the kind of personal reference, I, I, my colleague, my brilliant colleague, Tabitha Bonilla uh, at Northwestern and I, uh, we actually polled Georgia during the, uh, the runoff elections for the Senate. And what we found is that those seats flipped in large part because of the Black Lives Matter organizing that was happening and hype supercharging Black, Latino and Asian turnout and also flipping uh, a lot of white suburban, uh, the Atlanta ring suburbs uh, to the Democrats on Black Lives Matter messaging. Uh, and so Warnock embraced that uh, and, and Abrams uh, group was, was really central to kind of pushing those messages along with Latasha Brown's Black Voters Matter. And, and so they absolutely do collaborate, yes. Yeah, and, and to follow up on the first part of that question, um, you know, activists, I mean, so there's this, you know, part of what I talk about in the book is this idea that these, these Black legislators, Latino legislators, they're really trying to figure out, are they activists, are they legislators? And I mean, they've pretty much settled their, their combination of both, right? Like, um, they have to, they, they're they're un, they're in tune with some of the needs. All those their critics would say they're not, uh, especially the longer that they stay in office. Um, but they also realize, and this is the concern I think that we were talking about early on offline, is this idea that um, that is these Black and Latino members, and most of them are in the Democratic Party. I mean, there's not as many in the Republic. There are some more more Latinos in the Republican Party than Blacks. But this idea that once you stay longer in the party, you start seniority matters, you get on committees, you get more power, um, you become part of leadership. You know, you got Hakeem Jeffries and uh, Jim Clyburn in the House leadership. Uh, so there's this tendency of like, okay, you were a strong advocate, but now you're part of the team. And part of the team is, we got to stay in power. We have to stay in the majority. And so you might have to moderate that message. Maybe, maybe you came in there, you know, raising hell, you know, we need to check black and brown this, but now you're part of the team. And there are about what, 25 to 35 congressional seats that are truly competitive in the, in the US. And they're usually not the most liberal uh, districts 
uh, not the most conservative. That's why they're competitive. And so the messaging is very different from, say, like um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, like her district. I mean, and then, or even Nancy Pelosi's district. I mean, very different message when you're in a more moderate uh, to conservative district. You have, a, you have to have a different message that doesn't necessarily believe in, you know, some of these messaging like to fund the police. That's not going to work in these 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 competitive districts. Now, they will argue the the activists, the more liberals say, like Al, you were saying in Georgia, it brought the energy. So yeah, so it's yeah, it's not going to make the difference, but it brings people to the polls. It energizes people. So the fact that establishment will say, okay, like Speaker Pelosi will say, well, you know. Um, Ilhan Omar or or um, uh, or, or uh, Rashida Tlaib, those districts aren't going to get us the majority. They're already Democratic districts anyway. So we got to focus our messaging on these more um, conservative, the moderate districts. But like like you were saying, Al, but how do you energize people around a more moderate message? Like you want to hold on to the majority, but yet you still want to get people energized coming out. And that's what's happening on even the Republican side. You know, many of the establishment like, we don't want this, you know, we don't want this message of these real conservatives because it's going to hurt us in these general elections. But they're like, hey, but how are we going to energize people to come out and support our candidates? So that's what the activists and the legislators and people in the party are dealing with all the time. To that point about um, the distribution of uh, Black and Latino uh, uh, Democrats, right? Um, the one of the the questions gets at um, uh, the situation for Black and Latino Republicans um, as their party increasingly resorts to dog whistle uh, politics. Um, are they activists um, or acting in an activist role as well, um, in the same way that we can think about Democrats doing that work? or Black and Latino Democrats doing that work? Oh, I, I'll, I'll, I, I don't think so. I mean, I don't, I think, you know, the, the, the best, most recent example is, is Senator Tim Scott, right? Who, uh, and this is where, I mean, Michael's done a lot of great work on his own and, and you have as well, Jamil, on, symbolic representation, right? And so this is where the kind of symbolic representation, the embodiment of having black people representing the conservative agenda when, you know, as our colleagues, uh, Cheryl and Ishmael showed recently, you know, regardless of kind of personal ideology, like black people are solidly democratic voters, right? And, and so, Part of that, what we saw with the negotiations over the George Floyd Policing Act is that Senator Scott was able to kind of deploy his symbolic positionality, saying consistently, I've been stopped by the police in South Carolina. He said that like, you know, every other week when they're negotiating the bill, and then, you know, he wouldn't budge on any of the key provisions, you know, and so um, I don't see activism around policy that's really going to advance black and brown people in the ranks of Republican electeds. Um, I see uh, a kind of, you know, attempt to explain away the need for reform uh, that's also driven by the, the kind of donor class and their own calculations um, I mean, Tim Scott is no Colin Powell, whom we lost uh, this week. Colin Powell famously stood in the Rose Garden in 2004 and in front of George Bush and said that he was wrong about affirmative action. And he actually hoped that the administration would lose the Michigan case, <laughs> right? Because he thought that it was not a quota program and that affirmative action was a really important tool to help people like him uh, you know, uh, advance, right? And so I don't see that kind of balance in any of the Republican electeds that we currently have. And I think it goes back to what Michael was just talking about, the, 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 the competitive nature, the fact that all these seats are safe, there's a certain type of messaging that's required to get through a primary, 
And so that's gonna, that's gonna, you know, tamp down the ability of a black Republican elected to do anything for, for, you know, black constituencies, in my view. I don't have anything to add. Okay, uh, so uh, the next question um, asks, how do you combat voter apathy or fatigue among blacks and, and other uh, people of color, especially when they see little or no movement from Congress because of opposition from the GOP and the White House and state and local government not pushing for change as much as they want? Yeah, I mean, that's always the, the process of Congress, right, and, and lawmaking. And we know that it was purposely designed, right, to put a status quo, not to do anything. And so you get all this, you get people mobilized, they're marching, they're or writing to their legislators, demanding change, even have people in Congress now that are saying, we're gonna get things done. Uh, we're gonna reform the police. We're gonna get rid of some of these discriminatory practices. Uh, minimum wage, raise that, and then it doesn't happen. And people are like, and, and so, you know, <laughs> that, I mean, that's a, a tough question. Like, how do you, and then what you see is the approval ratings of Congress are super low, right? Because they don't get anything done. And then also in this polarized environment that we're in, there isn't an incentive for the minority party to work with the majority party because, you know, right now, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell, when Obama's like, you know, we're gonna try to make him a one-term president, we're not gonna really, really work with him. And I mean, and right now, I think you see the same thing. Democrats maybe played it less so than Republicans in terms of just the refusal to work with Donald Trump. I mean, we could have a whole discussion on, on, on the Trump presidency, right? And how he dealt with the US Congress. But right now, I mean, people are thinking that uh, that Joe Biden was the more moderate candidate and he was in the U, uh, US Senate, that he could kind of overcome some of this polarization and we could get some movement, say, on police reform, um, uh, economic issues uh, as they relate uh, to minority communities. And we see that a lot of this stuff is still, that polarization is there. Joe can't just talk to his buddies in the Senate and get things done. And then even going back to the, the Tim Scott, you know, Tim Scott, uh, there are many things in his bill, the George Floyd Policing Act, that just are untenable to, to Democrats. So it's these, this back and forth of like, we want to get something done, but there really isn't an incentive for these parties to get things done because they want to get back in the majority. And that's in the House and the Senate. And um, if, if you don't mind me taking one privilege, there's a question about the voting, like ranked choice voting, would that, would that somehow change the politics, right? Would it, would it make, um, make legislators less likely to engage in these polarizing campaigns? Um, would it also uh, allow for uh, the most extreme candidates uh, to prevent them from being elected. And I think there's evidence to show that that ranked choice voting can engage in moderating um, the type of candidates, particularly on the right. Um, you can't run these candidates. Like right now, I just saw an ad. Um, if I if I win, we're going to get rid of critical race theory in schools. That's the. <laughs> like, like, again, some people out there are going to say, "Why are you laughing at that?" Is I'm, I'm just saying that's not the most important issue that Congress, I mean, that you're running on that, right? And that type of poll, and we know, as you were saying, some of the dog whistling that's going on in order to incite people and, and divide people. And, and I think that ranked choice voting, or just looking at our, our voting schemes could get rid of the type of politics where we're trying to polarize people based on, on race and um, really allow for candidates to moderate their message and then when they get in the Congress, it might lead to candidates willing to work across the aisle, maybe in some of this polarization and get some of these sensible reforms that are necessary. Michael, let me, let me ask you a follow-up on that. So I totally agree with everything you've just said, but would something easier be like changing the composition of the Senate? 
Because it seems to me, for, even from your book, the real problem is the Senate. And that the, that the way that we select senators reinforces the power of a shrinking white majority, right? That by 2030 will be a minority, right? And so what if we had proportional representation of the Senate, would you still see polarization as, as being as big a problem as, as it is under our current system? Wow, that, I mean, that's, that's a good, you know, the, the thing that's very interesting is how, and, and I think there are more studies that need to be done. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I think polarization might still happen, right? Because as we see uh, the number of Blacks and Latinos increasing in the House uh, represented, I mean, it's more diverse than it was 20 years ago, right? 30 years ago, more Blacks. I mean, and it is approaching parity within the overall U.S. population representation of Blacks and Latinos and overall U.S. population. And the Senate, right, it's like 3%, for, I mean, it's still very low. Um, I, I don't know if it would necessarily uh, change polarization because I think that some people are actually responding to, I think part of the polarization is a result of the changing diversity of the country and seeing those voices represented within the US Congress. And I think there is kind of a backlash, just like Obama being elected to president as a backlash and people were able to campaign off of that and Tea Party activists and, uh, and, and, and even Trump winning to really create an agenda to Freedom Caucus that's based kind of on this, this racial resentment. It's not necessarily, I mean, it's not necessarily policy. And there are a lot of research that's showing that there is some racial resentment around that. So I think that we would still have some polarization, even if you had a more diverse um, Senate um, that really kind of reflected uh, overall society. I just think that, yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know, to be honest, I really don't know the answer to that. I don't know if it would. I don't think any of us do, right. but I just want yeah. to see you take a crack at it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a tough question. Um, so it looks like our um, our final question brings us back to um, uh, an earlier conversation about um, the, the role of organizations like NAACP and UNIDOS. Um, and it asks, uh, do the NAACP and La Raza and the other groups you mentioned have a 501c4 advocacy, advocacy group labeled as an action fund? In other words, can a lobbyist be seen as an action advocate? Lobbying is often viewed as a nasty thing, yet if advocates aren't busy lobbying, they miss the opportunity to help draft legislation, et cetera. Yeah, and I mean, I think many of these groups now, um, uh, I mean, NAACP has gone back and forth in terms of the type of entities. Most of them carry a C4, a C3, the charitable group, and also the C4, which we, most people know is this social welfare groups. Um, and some people have, Call, use the term dark money groups because you can't reveal who their donors are. And, and there's the idea that they're getting all this money and they're advocating and they're doing all these issue ads. And so, uh, so but many of these groups carry both of the entities. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, I kind of agree that I don't think, I mean, lobbying does have kind of this negative connotation. Most, most advocate, they like to use the word advocacy. I mean, I think most lobbyists like we're advocates. Um, but they're lobbying, right? Um, and there are some formal definitions, and that's why some groups, uh, when you use lobbying and you engage in lobbying, there are, there's formal definitions of it. And if some of these groups exceed, like the, C, the charitable organizations, they, they're not supposed to do it. They can advocate for issues, but they're not supposed to go and say, support this legislation again. But if you get like a, a C4, the social welfare groups, they can engage um, um, in some in some advocacy and do more than um, than the 501c3. Uh, so I yeah I, I think you know I've thought about this idea of whether or not we should even get rid of these restrictions on these these groups and just allowing them to lobby. Um, but I think it gets back into those same debates. Do I want my tax dollars? Because many of these C3s, they get tax breaks and benefits. Do I want my tax dollars or, or the tax breaks that these organizations get because of my tax dollars, do I want them advocating on issues that I don't necessarily agree with? 
So I, I think that's that's a fair point, but I still uh, think that maybe we should remove or consider removing some of the limitations on on lobbying for for these organizations because they're doing it anyway. Um, it looks do like the, do I have the last word? What? <laughs> uh, Al, did you have any thoughts here? No, I'm going to let Michael have the last word. It's his book panel, but I just want to <laughs> say thank you for including me. This has been great. Um, yes, I, I, I think this was a really great conversation. And I think I, I do want to end it with Michael having uh, uh, the, the last word. So uh, thank you. And uh, we have Larry back. So um, thank you all for joining us. And uh, uh, this was a great conversation. Yeah. No, so I just want to say thanks to uh, Professor Scott, Professor Tillery, um, for, for joining in this conversation to talk about these very important uh, matters and to thank Larry and the center for, for sponsoring this, this conversation and hopefully we'll continue to have more of these in the future. So thank you. I think, <clears throat> thank you all three of you. <clears throat> this was a terrific um, conversation, really raised a lot of issues. Um, many of the issues you raised uh, may be surprising to some people, have not followed the research, I appreciate your integrity and your commitment to the research you're doing. Uh, we're about to uh, close out, but I just did want to give you a heads up on, um, on some events we've got coming up. As you may know, there's uh, some very important ballot initiatives being voted on in Minneapolis. Um, they're getting obviously a lot of coverage in Minnesota, but also nationally. And we've got one and maybe more programs coming up next week. On Monday, October 25th, we have a uh, conversation on rate, rate, rent stabilization uh, that's on the ballot, both in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And we're going to be joined by my colleague at the Humphrey School, Professor Ed Getz, who's been doing quite a bit of research on housing for many years, but also on rent stabilization policy. He'll be joined by Jennifer Arnold, who's director of Inkill Nidas, um, an organization here in the Twin Cities. On Wednesday, October 27th, uh, Marshall Gans from uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard will be join joining us to talk about the strength and challenges of community organizing. Um, next month in October, excuse me, November uh, 17th, we're gonna have an event on health reform, looking at the impact of the legislation that's been moving through Congress on um, the Affordable Care Act um, and its future directions. Uh, that's gonna be a, another terrific program. And then we've got uh, a program on November 19th uh, with well-known conservatives, Vin Weber and Rich Lowry, who was until recently editor of the National Review. All those programs will be at noon um, central time. Um, and you can see there are links to that. We're glad to share that information with you in the coming days. Let me also uh, just give you a heads up. Today's uh, conversation, like our other conversations, are available through your favorite uh, social media stations, including YouTube and Stitcher um, and um, other podcast sources that you may use. Um, we do recommend you sign up for the podcast as a lot of people have been doing. Um, and finally, all our programs are free and open to the public. They do cost uh, resources though. If you'd like to help us out, please do. We'd welcome that support. Finally, let me thank all of you for joining us today and thank our terrific panel, uh, Dr. Jamil Scott, Dr. Michael Minta, and Dr. Alvin Tillery. Thanks to all of you and thanks to our panelists.